Hello and welcome to Maths on the Move, the podcast from plus.maths.org. I'm Rachel Thomas. What you just heard was the beautiful sound of humpback whales. We humans have long been fascinated by whales, but these beautiful and majestic ocean creatures still remain mysterious to us in so many ways. We don't understand their haunting and complex song, for example, and for some species we don't even know where they go to breed. One thing we do know, though, is that our behaviour has an effect on whales. There are concerns, for example, that the constant noise caused by shipping and other human activity in the oceans bothers and confuses them and that this may disrupt their ability to go on their annual migrations. Stuart Johnston of the University of Melbourne in Australia uses mathematics to understand the migration of whales and how it might be impacted by human-generated noise, with the ultimate aim of figuring out what we can do to mitigate the disruption we cause. My colleague Marianne Freiberger recently talked to Stuart via Zoom, so apologies for the occasional glitch with the sound, after seeing Stuart give a fascinating talk at the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Cambridge. The talk was part of a workshop on collective behaviour, which itself was part of a six-month research programme on the mathematics of movement, which is currently taking place at the Newton Institute. Marianne started by asking Stuart exactly what kind of questions he's trying to answer with his work and why. So we know that we have long distance migration all throughout the animal kingdom. So we see birds, for example, um, Arctic terns that go all the way from the Arctic to the Antarctic each year. I think that's a trip of something like 30,000 kilometers. Um, so that's just you know one, one example, but we see it throughout the animal kingdom. So that sometimes this happens individually, so for solitary animals, and sometimes it happens for collective groups. Uh, so we focus more on the second cave. Uh, second case. So we know if migration occurs as part of a group, it relies on a couple of things. Uh, so the first is the detection of some kind of information that tells you where to go. So I guess a bit like using Google Maps on your phone, um, animals can detect certain signals that tell them where they, they uh, the direction they need to travel in. Obviously, it's not quite as accurate as using your phone, but it's still pretty good. Uh, this, this signal might be a scent, it might be a chemical. Uh, in fact, certain animals can use the stars or detect the magnetic field of the Earth to tell them where to go. And the second thing they rely on is being able to detect what others in their group is doing and where those others are going. So this is a bit more complicated for whales. I guess for us as humans, we tend to think of detecting information via vision, but this is really based on how we detect the world. Uh, so whales don't actually have great eyesight. You know, light doesn't travel very far in the water, so it's not very useful for them. But they're really good at communicating via sound because that spreads very effectively in the water. So I guess our intuitive ideas about the definitions of groups being individuals that are really, really close together isn't necessarily the way to think about things here. You know, if, if these individuals or these whales are able to talk to each other over you know, maybe 100 kilometers, you know, who's to say that they aren't effectively part of the same group if they can detect each other on, you know, if they're separated by a kilometer or two, even if they aren't visually in the same group. Um, but I guess the ability of the sound to travel so efficiently underwater is a bit of a blessing and a curse. Uh, it means that the whales are able to communicate over these really long distances, but it also means that any other noise sources in the ocean travel just as far, and human activities in the oceans have increased dramatically over the last 100 years. You know, anything from you know, ship sonar uh, to ships surveying for natural resources, for us building oil and gas rigs, uh, wind farms, and you know, any kind of shipping traffic for the vast quantities of goods that just go around the planet. So all of these things make noise, and when you put them together, um, it means that the whales are living in an environment that's much, much noisier than the environment that they evolved to cope with. So it's really quite plausible that they're not able to detect each other or communicate with each other in the same way that they used to hundreds of years ago. So what we want to understand is how this increase in human activity and increase in the ocean noise is affecting the ability of the whales to migrate. So if they aren't able to communicate with each, um, with as many other whales, you know, are they missing out on some important information that they need to perform these long distance migrations? And if that's the case, well, what are the options that we have or that we can take to try and mitigate the impacts that we're having on the whales? So we know the increase in noise is affecting the whales, but it's really hard to say precisely how it's affecting them. So we know that they're stressed essentially, but you know, the impact of that is a little bit less certain. Um, so really, we just really want to understand the impact of the choices that we're making on these um, you know, majestic creatures. Mm -hmm. 
So you quoted the researchers Roger Payne and Douglas Webb, who said in a 1970s paper, they said that whales are reticent laboratory subjects. So what did you mean by that? And how does that bring mathematics into the picture? Um, so I think this is actually a, a great quote. And um, for those people who are listening who don't know who Roger Payne was, who actually um, recently passed away, actually, uh, he was one of the people who discovered the singing of humpback whales. He also released an album a few years later of the recordings that he made of the whale songs, and that album ended up going multi-platinum, I think. Uh, so oh, wow, I didn't know that was him. Wow, interesting. Okay. So why did he say that thing about them being reticent lab animals? Yeah, so I guess what they meant there is that, I guess, un unlike a lot of other research in biology and ecology, we don't really have the ability to study these whales in controlled conditions in the lab. And you know, So, for example, if you want to study how fish behave and how they might form schools, you can put them in a big tank in a lab and you know watch how they move on a camera and just test some ideas you might have. So it makes it possible to test some hypotheses you might have in a controlled way, and you can get really nice data, really clean data on how they move and behave. But we can't really do this with whales. You know, they're much harder to find in the first place compared to fish. You know, they're, they're very very big animals, but the ocean is a huge place, so they're kind of hard to find. And there's you know also uh, ethical and practical considerations that mean you can't just capture whales from the oceans and put them in a large tank somewhere. Uh, so we've seen you know very very much changing public perception about keeping animals like orp orcas in captivity over the last you know ten or twenty years, for example. Um, so I, this inability to do controlled lab experiments, I think, is the reason why mathematics can be a powerful tool here. So if we can develop mathematical models that capture the essential features of how these whales behave in real life, basically you know we can believe what comes out of the model. We can start making changes in the model to test how the whales might respond to changes in their environment. So I think this is very exciting because we can't necessarily make those changes in real life very easily. Um, actually, uh, it's worth pointing out that we've seen, you know, th there was one test recently in the sense that uh, one side effect of the COVID pandemic is that there was a massive reduction in the noise due to cruise ships not being able to operate. And we almost saw immediate changes in whale behavior as the ocean became a bit quieter. So we saw changes in the um, coal frequency. We saw them spreading out and returning to areas that they hadn't been for a while, uh, just because there was this change in the, the local environment. But obviously, you know, the pandemic was a was a weird time and pretty pretty awful time. And we don't want to repeat that just for scientific point of view. Um, so we said we can use models to examine other changes. Uh, so for an example, one thing that we looked at using our model recently was, you know, what might happen if the shipping traffic in the North Sea increased by 50%. Uh, so this is something that could happen in the future as the, you know, the population of the planet continues to grow and there's more and more goods going around the globe. Um, but you can imagine if you wanted to test that you know, in a, as an experiment or as a hypothesis, it might be very hard to convince people to you know, do an experiment that involves moving hundreds of ships around the ocean. Um, but using maths, we can you know, test these ideas and see what might happen. So the maths gives you a way of simulating whale behavior uh, and then playing around what, with how the behavior would change if you change conditions. Yeah, absolutely. And because this is such a, a large scale problem, the, the conditions that we can't change in reality. And um, so, so the next question is, how do you model whale behavior? How do you capture that with mathematics? And to give people a sense of it, you model an individual whale's movement path as something called a velocity jump random walk. So could you tell us roughly what that is and how that works? Yep, yep. So as you say, we use um, a velocity jump random walk. Uh, so these are also known as run and tumble processes, which maybe is an easier way of visualizing what's going on. So it's a type of mathematical model that says that individuals travel in a straight line for, you know, in some certain direction for a random amount of time. This is the, the run part of the run and tumble. And after they do that run, they pick a new direction to move in, which is the tumble part. Um, you know, after they choose that new direction, you know, they move in a straight line again for a while and then pick another direction to just repeat this run and tumble process. Uh, I guess there's a, a classic analogy when you're teaching this to you know, undergraduate students is the um, the drunkard trying to find their way home. So they pick a direction, they walk that way for a while, you know, but because they're drunk, they don't really know where they're going. They just pick a direction at random, but eventually they've decided they've walked that way for long enough and they haven't found their way home. Uh, so maybe they should pick a new direction and go that way and they just kind of repeat this process until eventually maybe you find your way home by pure luck. Uh, if you want to you know, test this yourself, you could get a piece of paper and just draw a straight line for a while and then pick a new direction and draw a straight line, different direction for a while. And you know, maybe you put a dot somewhere on that piece of paper and see how long it takes you to cross that dot just by picking lines at random. 
Um, so that's the type of model. But, you know, of course, we know that whales aren't drunk. Um, they actually have a pretty idea of where they're going. So instead of picking a direction at random, what we do is we say that they're going to pick a direction that's kind of close where they want to go. It's still a little bit of randomness. There's always a little bit of uncertainty. Uh, so they're still picking a random direction. But as a consequence, they're definitely going to get where they need to go. It's just a question of, you know, how, or how long that takes and how much randomness there is. And I guess this is where the complexity in the model comes in for what we do is in determining how much randomness to include in that model. So in our modeling, it depends on a number of factors, including you know, how much information those whales can detect about you know, where they want to go, you know, that signal I was talking about before, um, and also how many other whales that whale can hear based on where they are and how much noise there is. Um, so I guess in our model, if the whales had perfect information, they could hear lots of other whales. They'd basically just be traveling in a straight line towards where they want to go. Um, but if they had no information or if they couldn't hear lots of other whales, they might behave a little bit more like that drunk from before. But I guess in, in reality, they know that they're not that bad at navigating. They always have a, a pretty good idea where, where to go. Mm. And um, what is the other signal in that in the case of the whales, apart from um, detecting where others are going? What what draws them? In a um, yeah, so this, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question that we don't really know the answer to. So there's some evidence that certain whale species can respond to the, um, the Earth's magnetic field. There's also some evidence that some whales might rely on the sound of kind of hearing icebergs crashing together in the distance and using that as a method of navigation, which I guess would be an auditory signal. Um, but yes, it's it's not really clear what they're doing. Mm. We can't really ask them. Okay, so in your model, you don't really know what is the signal that draws them, but you can still assume there is a signal that they're trying, yep. that they're using for orientation. And you're assuming that they're also influenced by the other whales' behavior. And then they're in the random bit, of the of the model path um the the choice will be random but it will be influenced by these factors to a certain extent so the randomness is skewed towards the signal and what they detect from other whales yeah yeah so they're always on average moving towards the direction that they want to go it's just this how much of a spread around that um, direction there is so if you had no information you'd just essentially be picking at random if you had really good information you'd be almost always heading in the right direction with maybe a, a little bit of randomness either side or you might be somewhere in the middle where you're going roughly in the right direction, but maybe in a zigzag pattern. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of like the core of your model, this idea of this um, run and tumble, random walk. Um, what other factors have you been able to include that impact whale motion? So I, I guess all of this, all of the modeling that we're doing is kind of feeding into this direction picking or this level of randomness uh, in the model. Um, I guess it's also worth including a disclaimer that we're not fully done here. There's still plenty more things to include, but we haven't we haven't done all of it yet. Um, but I'm, I'm sure they'll be important to include in the future. So I guess the most important thing that we've done so far is really looking at the interaction between you know, the human driven oceanic noise and um, the whale communication, how that might affect the whale's behavior. So as I said before, because they rely so heavily on um, sound in contrast to us relying on sight, they're very sensitive to changes in the local background noise. And we're seeing more and more of this um, you know, shipping, extra, tripping, shipping traffic and resource exploration. And you know, all, all that's affecting how much noise there is. So we've included this in a few different ways in this kind of selection heading process in our model. Uh, so the first is that the whales have to compete with the background noise to be able to communicate with each other. So if you, if you think about how easy it is to have a chat with a friend in a quiet coffee shop where there aren't too many people around and the music's quite quiet, uh, you can talk about all sorts of complicated things. But if you compare that with trying to have a chat with a friend in a very loud bar or a nightclub where it's packed and the music's turned up to 11, uh, you can't really hear or say anything too sensible there. You know, you're probably shouting at each other and you might be right in each other's ears. And you know, the next day you might wake up with a bit of a sore throat because you've been shouting for hours or something like that. Um, and I guess from a scientific point of view, we know that um, actually humans and birds and whales all respond to these loud environments through something known as the um, the Lombard effect. So basically, if it's loud, there's this kind of involuntary response where the pitch and the intensity of your voice changes. And there's also some evidence that suggests that the level inf of information and what you're trying to communicate tends to decrease. So you're not having you know, complicated conversations in these very loud environments. So what, what this means is that you know we know that the whales are trying to adapt to this increased noise in the ocean by communicating a little bit differently. But we also know that there's only so much ability for them to adapt. You know, if you think about how you might change, you can only shout so loudly before you, you, know, you can't shout any louder at all, right? Um, eventually you just get drowned out by the background noise. So in the model, what we do is we, we simulate the whale calls and how they spread through the ocean. So we can use maths and physics to you know, have some estimated model 
of how that sound propagates. Um, and then from that, we can say, you know, based on how far apart any two whales are, we can calculate how loud that whale's call would be as detected by the second whale, um, and how that compares to the, the, the background noise. So if it's too low relative to the background noise, we say they aren't really able to hear it. You know, just like if you're trying to have a conversation in the noisy pub, but your friend's a little bit quiet, you know, sometimes you can't hear what they say at all, right? Um, and I guess that's quite important for the model. And you know, if they can't hear where the other whales are, when you can't hear what they're saying, this might be really key to effective navigation. So we don't really know what they're saying to each other, but the communication certainly seems important. And even if it is only detection of where the other whales are, it's still an important feature of that navigation. Uh, so that's, I guess, one, one thing that we built into the model that I think is quite important. And maybe a second thing that's worth mentioning is noise avoidance. So we know that there are a lot of marine mammals that tend to move away from areas of very loud noise. Uh, I think this makes sense. So if, you, if you're hanging out at home and someone starts drilling outside your window, you probably want to go somewhere quieter if they're going to be doing that all day. Uh, so we built some, you know, similar behavior into our model. So if it gets too loud, a whale might decide that it's better to get away from that loud region. So instead of navigating or migrating to where it wants to go, it might decide that it's more important to get away from that loud region and go to somewhere a bit quieter. So there's a bit of a trade-off to be made there as well. So I guess there's plenty of other things in the model. Um, we might be here all day if we discussed everything, um, but you know, other things like the depth of the ocean, the ocean currents, all influence migration behavior. Yeah. And we've made sure to include those in the model as yeah, well. Yeah, because they also want to avoid they also want to avoid beaching themselves, obviously. And I remember exactly, you said yes. that there's a component of your model where uh, ocean depth is important. So they will steer away from areas that get too, too shallow. Yeah, you know, if things get too shallow, then maybe you don't want to navigate. Maybe you want to go back to the deeper water because you've just drifted off course. So that's like the noise avoidance. Like when something gets beyond the critical value, you just want to go the other way rather than. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I guess from a mathematical point of view, they were implemented in a very similar way even if they're you know, very different behavior. Okay, so, so you build your model where essentially a whale is imagined as moving around in this drunkard walk or run and tumble or velocity jump way where um, um, the random choice of direction is influenced by this combination of factors um, that you have just mentioned. So, so you've built such a model and then you have um, you have applied it to understand minke whale migration in the North Sea. So why those whales and why that are in that location? Why did you choose those? Yeah, yeah. Minky whales? Um, so again, I guess you should probably have a disclaimer saying that we're not claiming this is exactly minke whales in exactly the North Sea. And I guess also part of the appeal of using maths here is that you could change the model with in not too significant ways to make it describe other whales or other areas. I think this is just a, a general benefit of mathematical modeling. Um, but yeah, in general, the North Sea and Mickey whales is kind of an interesting example because there's really, there's really good data availability for things that we need to include in the model. Um, so I've talked a lot about you know all, all of these responses depending on how noisy it is at a certain location. And it turns out some other researchers have gone to some great lengths to generate sound maps in the North Sea. So these are maps that change over space and time that tell you, you know, that kind of correspond to where the ships are in the North Sea and how much noise each of these ships are making and how that noise is spreading based on you know, the characteristics of that location. Uh, so they put all of this information together and um, generated these maps. And we can use these maps to feed into our model because they tell us you know, how much background noise there is at any location due to you know, the ships and the wind and the rain. And that's really important because we can use that to work out whether the whales can hear other whales, you know, depending on their relative locations and depending on how much how, how loud the signals they're making are. Um, so there's, there's plenty of shipping traffic in the North Sea. There's plenty of oil and gas rigs. And I, I think I've seen in the news in the UK, there's been more uh, wind farms proposed in the North Sea in recent times. So all, all of these things make noise. I guess that's primarily in the construction side of things for the, the oil rigs and the wind farms. Um, but having all of that data available in the North Sea is, is really important for having, you know, I guess, a realist or being able to trust what comes out of the model. And there's lots of other data available there as well, uh, which we also include in the model. So things like estimates of the ocean currents, uh, using detailed maps of the ocean floor or you know, how deep the water is at any point. Um, I guess also on top of this, there's actually a reasonable number of minke whales in the North Sea. They're not too rare. So there is some hope in the future of having, I guess, the right kind of observational data that we can compare with what comes out of the model. Um, but this is, I guess, a bit, a bit in the future and will probably be reasonably difficult. Uh, yeah, comparisons of data here are not really straightforward. 
So you applied your model to those minke whales. So uh, wh what did it tell you, the model? So the, the model suggests that we should see um, actually distinct differences in how the migration beha behavior changes depending on what the dominant response to the noise is. Uh, so for example, if it might just be the case that the migration is a little bit slower because they're migrating less effectively, but equally it could be possible that they drift more off course because they're more susceptible to the ocean currents, but it really depends what's the most important response. Uh, we, the model also suggests that in really extreme noise cases, the migration might fail completely. Obviously, that's not what we're seeing in real life at the moment. So that's suggesting that that would happen at a much higher level of noise than what we're seeing in the ocean at the moment. But the model suggests that might be possible. But you know, there are plenty, plenty of caveats there. Um, I guess the point here is we don't fully understand the whale behavior and with this more, much more work to be done. And we need to compare what comes out of the model against the current observations. But because we are seeing the suggestion of quite distinct changes we may be we might be able to identify what these um what, what the dominant response to the noise is even if we don't fully understand the behavior yeah so by dominant uh response what could that be uh, yes yeah, so i guess that? the examples before we had were um you know is, is it because they're losing communication with other whales or is it because they're spending some of the time avoiding loud areas or is it because they're you know they can't hear those icebergs in the distance anymore which of these responses is affecting the migration the most and depending on which one of those it is we expect to see something different in kind of the migration path all right so that's very interesting so uh so your model the idea is that eventually it it will not only tell you that the background noise does influence the behavior and maybe cause navigation to be slower or even to fail but also exactly what factor makes that happen so you know, once you've done more work and, and you've, um, you have you might be able to identify that and then that could guide our response as humans to, to that. Yeah, exactly. What lessons, I mean, I know this is still work in progress and you still have to do more, but on the whole, what can we actually do about this, do you think? Because I mean, there's, isn't there isn't really a chance that shipping will uh, drastically reduce in the future or that people will stop building oil rigs and things so what what so if assuming that it does turn out that the background noise is a noise is a really big problem for the whales what could we do short of sh stopping all shipping <laughs> yes yeah, so as you say that's that's probably quite unlikely um, and I, I guess, yeah, the, the point is at the moment, we don't really have the level of understanding to say, like, what what is the effect of the choices that we're making at the moment? So if, if we want to build a new wind farm or a new oil rig, and we know that the construction is going to make some noise of, say, you know, maybe a couple of hundred decibels for a month or so, you know, how, how do we possibly say what effect that's going to have on the whales? So we know at the moment it's, you know, stressful for them. That's, again, not hard to imagine, because if someone's drilling next to you for a month, you're probably going to be a little bit stressed, but it's really hard to say what the exact effect is going to be. And, you know, that's kind of why we're trying to, well, that's, that's what we're working towards so we can say more confidently what the effect is. But I guess before that happens and before that understanding is really there, I guess we should just be careful about the potential impact of the choices. You know, so for construction, we know that there's mitigation methods that you can use in offshore construction. So you can slowly ramp up the construction noise so the marine animal, animals have a chance to you know, essentially leave the area before the noise becomes too damaging, rather than just starting out with the, la the, the loudest noise immediately. Alternatively, if we know when the migration times happen in that area, we can do construction in other times of year, sorry, other times of the year. So these are kind of, I guess, being more cautious in our approaches. Um, but as you say, it's you know, not quite as straightforward as you know, never doing any construction or stopping all shipping. You know, for the construction of wind farms, for example, you're trying to balance off you know, creating more sources of renewable energy because that's critical for avoiding the climate crisis, which also affects the whales. Um, but you know, it, it's it's a balance of risks, I guess, and it's really hard to balance those properly when we don't really understand the consequences of the choices and actions we're taking at the moment. So really, just mm. advocating for more understanding so we can better understand the, the consequences. Mm. And your work is meant to contribute to that. That eventually we will find out more about exactly how and why the noise impacts on the whales, so and then we can be much more targeted in our mitigation measures. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's interesting what you said, because I recently had an experience where uh, somebody who owns the flat in the house I live in started construction without warning very suddenly. And that was very stressful. And you're right. I mean, if and we all, all the rest. Yeah. All the rest of us in the house, we were like, why didn't he warn us 
um, because it would have been so much better. So it's interesting that whales, it's very possible they feel the same way when something just start, start, suddenly starts up next to them. Interesting. Yeah, so so we, we do see it in some of the construction that's going on, at least of Australia. I know that they have to go through environmental assessments if they're doing you know, proposals for offshore wind farms, for example. And part of that is noise-based um, mitigation. So, the, yeah, so there's, there's engineering techniques. You have to do this cool thing where if you're going to put a pylon into the ocean floor, you can put a ring, a ring around the bottom of it and then it emits some bubbles. And so the noise has to travel through the water and then through the bubbles and then through the water again. But because it's kind of disrupted, a, a bit of the noise energy is lost and kind of the intensity drops off a bit. So there's things that you know we can do from an engineering point of view and people are aware of it. It's just making sure that these things are being done um, when these construction activities are taking place. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Um, okay, final question. How did you enjoy the workshop about the collective movement at the Newton Institute? Yeah, I, I thought it was really good. It was a fascinating combination of people working all the way from, you know, cells up through various types of animals, I guess, up to me doing whales, which is the, the biggest things, um, but also a collection of not just mathematicians. We had experimentalists and you know, people who go out to, I think it was yeah, someone who went and observed birds in Africa for a couple of months. So yeah, having the opportunity to interact with all of these you know, fascinating people was really, really enjoyable. And how did you get interested in, in this area? Yeah, I, I guess I've, from a mathematical point of view, I think it's interesting of how you, you deal with uncertainty when you're trying to make decisions. And we have a pretty good understanding of how things like cells do it because there's kind of limited machinery and how they can interact with chemical signals. But it's a much more interesting question from my point of view when you're thinking about you know, complex animals like whales, which are you know, highly intelligent, and there's lots of possible responses and you know ideas about how they could be reacting to things. So it gives you a bit more flexibility in trying to do modeling. And they're also, I think, just very charismatic creatures, which are you know, fascinating, fascinating to study. And there's not there's still not a huge amount known about a lot of whale species, which I think is really interesting, you know, given all of all of the other research we've done in the world. The fact that we you know, don't necessarily know where whales go to breed for certain species, even though we you know can track almost anything anywhere, and the fact that we don't know things, almost basic things like that, I think is really interesting. That was Stuart Johnston from the University of Melbourne talking to my colleague Marianne Freiberger about Stuart's work using maths to understand the lives of whales and hopefully reduce our impact on them. For another unrelated but also very interesting example of how maths can help whales, Go to plus.maths.org and search for Saving Whales Using Pythagoras. That's it for this episode of Maths on the Move. Thanks for listening and bye for now. <laughs>